All righty, so we've got 11 o'clock on my time. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for hopping on. Uh, we've got Dr. Jeremy Sloan with us today. My name is Kendra Wagner. I just have a few housekeeping slides that I'm gonna buzz through and it looks like a couple of people are still hopping on, so welcome. Um, so I have a few housekeeping slides that I'd like to go through and then I'm gonna pass things off to Jeremy and we'll get this started. So again, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining the Plant Healthcare webinar series. Uh, this is a great resource that Rainbow offers um, for continuing education units with ISA, as well as just if you're interested in some of these topics. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to give a little bit of a safety brief. Um, a lot of us are working from home, some of us in offices. I'd like you to check your surroundings for any trip hazards in case, in case of emergency if you need to leave quickly. Um, check the weather forecast for any inclement weather and make sure that you have a plan accordingly. And if you're in a vehicle, please, please, please pull off to the side and park in a safe location for the duration of this webinar. So again, my name is Kendra Wagner. I'm a research scientist with Rainbow Ecoscience. Uh, my background is in traditional and urban forestry. Um, and I've also attended Mississippi State University for my PhD in forest entomology. Um, this is my contact information here. If you uh, feel the need to reach out for anything, please do so. Uh, essentially, my job with Rainbow Ecoscience is to conduct field research and develop new products and protocols and equipment. I'm constantly seeking innovative solutions uh, for issues in our North American landscape. So again, please feel free to reach out to me or our solution center if you have any questions or concerns about anything. So a little bit of housekeeping. We are using Zoom for this webinar. Um, I will not be looking at the chat box for this webinar. Please use the Q&A box if you have any questions. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation, uh, so just pop them in there. Um, the webinar will be recorded and will be sent out via link at the end of the webinar. You'll have access to that about uh, two weeks after, the, after today. Um, and on the last slide, we do have the continuing education course code for ISA. Um, it's worth one ISA CEU. Um, if you did not enter your ISA certificate cert certification number when you registered, um, please put it in the Q&A or directly reach out to me um, and we'll, we'll get that on record for you. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Jeremy Sloan. He's an entomological researcher with Bartlett Tree Experts and has a master's and PhD with North Carolina State University, if that's correct, Jeremy. Um, and so please take it away. I'm going to stop sharing and you can go ahead and share your screen. Perfect. Right. Perfect. So I'm assuming you should be able to see my slides now. We can. Perfect. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hopefully this is really informative for everybody talking today about hemlock woolly adelgids. Now, a little bit about my background. Um, so like Kendra mentioned, um, I did get a master's and PhD at NC State, um, primarily working in agriculture, but looking at the integration of uh, IPM and pollinator conservation. So kind of how your management practices and your pollinator conservation practices can kind of come together in a way that's a little more harmonious if you're aware of it. Um, and fortunately, I find myself working at the Bartlett Tree Research Labs on the Arboretum here in Charlotte. So we've got about a little over 350 acres um, so depending on what kind of plant pests I might be interested in, I can possibly just hop out and see what that looks like in the landscape, which is very helpful. Um, that's a little bit about me. So to lay out kind of what we'll talk about today, uh, we'll talk about the U.S. introduction of Hemlock woolly adelgid, moving into a little bit of the life history and description of the pest, um, touch on feeding and damage and how those um, things are going to basically impact ecosystems as a result of the damage to hemlocks. Um, we'll wrap up with management and some interactions between um, hemlock trees, the adelgids, and some other critters as well. So regards to the U.S. introduction, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, this pest is native to East Asia, so the red area that you see in the map there details where the hemlock range is in Asia. Um, so you can see around Japan, China, Taiwan, India, Nepal, um, the pest is kind of scattered around in these areas, um, but is naturalized and has been there and kind of evolutionarily been with those host trees for an extended period of time. Now, when you shift over and look at the US, uh, we have two distinct populations, one in the west and one on the east. And they're actually geographically isolated, so we don't see a lot of um, mixing as a result of those two populations. If you're looking at the west coast specifically, uh, it was detected in Oregon around the 1920s. Uh, they did determine that this population is genetically distinct, um, and it actually is a lot more interesting than it sounds kind of superficially. 
Um, if you look at the trees in this area, the hemlock trees, as well as the pests, uh, this invasion establishment was likely a very long time ago. And I think the best guess is somewhere on the magnitude of tens of thousands of years. So counting on what you would maybe call an invasive pest, uh, it's obviously been present on the West Coast for an extended period of time. And as a result, the trees that we have, the hemlock trees on that coast also have a bit of pest resistance built in. So you could say that this is invasion, but it's also somewhat naturalized at this point because it's been present for such a long time period. Now that is in contrast to what we see on the East Coast. Uh, this was detected uh, in Richmond, Virginia, somewhere around the 1950s. Uh, the reality is it was probably present sometime before then, but built up to populations that were detectable. Um, and the work that's been done recently would suggest that these are of a Japanese origin. So at this point, the pest is kind of present as far south as Georgia, up into the northeast with Maine, and along that northern border over to Michigan. Um, however, the pest doesn't cover the full range of where hemlocks are present. So when you're comparing the host versus pest distributions, you can see um, in this map here on the right, all of those green areas are places where hemlocks are present, but the pest is not. So all of those more burgundy and yellow colors are just a reflection of when hemlock adelgid was detected, but you can see there's a fair amount of the range that hasn't been filled in yet. So we're likely going to see uh, more spread kind of to the north, kind of to the west, uh, partially as a consequence of a loss of eastern hemlocks. Um, just a fewer hosts essentially means the pest will be looking to move into other areas. But also, um, as a result of climate change and warming conditions, if temperatures become a little more suitable in that northern range, we could expect to spread up into those areas um, and continue kind of building out across that range of hemlocks. So next, we'll talk a little bit about life history. Um, this map is just showing you several of the different species of hemlocks that are present throughout um, different countries. Uh, this pest does feed exclusively on hemlock trees, but the only areas where we're seeing severe damage is on those eastern and Carolina hemlocks that occur in the eastern United States. And again, part of that is just that long-term resistance built up between the kind of evolutionary arms race between the pests and the host trees where it's been established for a much longer time frame. Uh, for at least in the U.S., we see about two generations per year. Um, there are more generations in its native range, and there's also um, a sexual generation that occurs um, from that summer generation. But if you're looking at this graph here on the right, you can see the yellow color and the orange color respond to the two generations that we see. Uh, that extended period from around June, July, all the way to that following March is the cistern's overwintering generation. And you have a much more contracted generation that occurs from about March to June. Um, in that early spring time frame called the progridians. Now it's this generation, those eggs of that progridians generation, about half of them usually uh, develop into winged individuals that in the native range have a tiger's tail, uh, tiger's tail spruce tree that they would migrate to and have a sexual generation. Um, however, that host is not present in the US, so all of those winged individuals are more or less kind of a dead end. Um, but that would be something that would be a, a factor if you were looking at the native range. So all of the hemlock woolly adelgids that we have in the U.S. consequently are parthenogenic, which means that all of their unfertilized eggs can give rise to viable adults without any kind of mating being necessary. Um, so our populations are predominantly females that are laying these non-fertilized eggs, and they kind of can persist on this hemlock host without having to alternate hosts like some insects. Um, and overwintering females from that over from that longer generation period have an average of around 200, maybe up to 300 eggs. Um, but the females that are present during that spring generation tend to only have around 75 or less. So there's a little bit of variability um, in terms of how the individuals within those generations may behave. Um, but obviously the time frame for development is also quite different. Um, and even in the presence of mortality factors, you can have populations that build up very rapidly with that kind of uh, reproductive potential. Now, if you're looking at it kind of at a, an annual period of those two generations, you can see that extended systems generation uh, goes through what's called a summer dormancy period. Um, in other words, this is an estivation as opposed to a hibernation, and this occurs during the heat of summer. So kind of around that August, September timeframe when you have a critical thermal maximum that may be detrimental to the insects, it's kind of just going to be more dormant, more uh, not really feeding, not really moving. Uh, just to kind of persist until cooler temperatures return. And at that point, development resumes. But again, at colder temperatures, insects develop a little slower. So consequently, it takes a little longer to reach the adult stage. Um, you can see again from that graph at the top right that as temperatures are going to warm up in some of those northern limits of the hemlock range, this pest will likely be able to adapt pretty well. But there is going to still be some critical lower temperature threshold, at which point the pest is not going to do very well. 
Um, but there is some amount of acclimation locally to colder conditions and some of the populations in the northern reach may be a little more resilient. Um, so you, again, you're just kind of looking here at the time frame for those two generations with the consequence of having that summer dormancy not really feeding in the in the summer. So your management timings may be in fact impacted by which uh, generation you're looking to target and which pests may be present at any given time. So as I mentioned, uh, we don't really have this alate sexual generation in the US, mostly because we don't have this host. They do still produce alate winged individuals. They just don't have anywhere to go. Um, there's actually been reports of a lot of these winged individuals kind of in mass washing up on beaches and shorelines kind of falling out of the sky in various areas. Uh, and it's just a consequence that they have nowhere to go. Um, so they just kind of accumulate and then pass, uh, pass on. But around half or so of the eggs from the overwintering generation would normally turn into this form. If you have really high population densities, this ratio can shift just a bit and you'll have more of the winged individuals. Um, and obviously that's gonna have implications for management because if you have more of these winged individuals, you have less individuals on the hemlock tree that are gonna generate that systems generation that overwinters. So um, again, just kind of different factors that may influence how abundant populations are. And then once you get an abundant population, what that might mean for generational population density. Now, if you were to look at what this uh, insect does on that secondary or I guess primary host for the sexual generation, the tiger cell spruce, it actually causes a gall, which again is challenging for management because the insects inside the gall are generally more protected. The same kind of holds true for the white woolly masses that develop around them on the hemlock trees as well. But if we look at dispersal, how this insect is actually moving, um, predominantly this is done by the crawler stage. It's the only point at which the individual is actually moving around. Um, once they actually insert their mouth parts, that's more or less it for their movement. But these crawlers are able to drift onto the wind, um, so kind of ballooning on air currents. They may also climb onto the feet of birds, other wildlife, things like that, and be able to disperse over much larger distances. Um, however, human-assisted movement of infested materials is also a really common thing that occurs for a lot of pests. Um, and any kind of material, whether that be nurseries, um, plants, or any kind of foliage that happens to have the insect that gets moved around, that can serve as an inoculation source. In terms of timing, there's an average of somewhere around five to 10 miles per year on the outer edges of the range that it's spreading. So you can see in this graph, just kind of a decade approach look at how fast this pest moved from that initial detection around 1951 in Virginia, and how kind of over time this has spread out. Hasn't been super rapid, but it has been um, reliably expanding over time. And we expect that it likely will continue to expand out, especially in the areas where it's already present um, at a given you know, cold tolerance or hardiness zone, it may continue to spread into those areas even before it reaches some of these northern limits. Um, and there is variability in the cold tolerance. So even though these are parthenogenic and are essentially reproducing clonally, um, some of these individual populations may be more adapted to colder temperatures and that may allow them to persist more so um, in those areas. So not every individual may make it, but if enough of the cold tolerant individuals do make it, the population that then generates over time is gonna be much more acclimated to those conditions. Um, and interestingly enough, we'll talk about this a little later, but when it comes to the biocontrol agents that are available for this pest, most of them are fairly cold tolerant as well. Um, maybe not quite as tolerant as some of these populations of the adelgid, um, but there's a really good chance that introducing some of these biological controls and cold weather conditions may kind of keep populations in check in some of the northern ranges. So detection, if you're looking to see if your tree has this particular pest, it is fairly easy, fortunately. Um, you'd mostly just need to look for these white woolly masses that develop on the shoots, um, kind of branch tips, um, particularly on the young twigs. That's gonna be the more tender succulent tissue. That tends to be what these piercing sucking insects want to feed on. Um, and generally you're gonna see it a little easier in the winter. And that's predominantly because you have that generation that has an extended uh, developmental time over that period. So you get that accumulation of the waxy materials around their bodies. Um, and that does provide them protection from predators and parasitoids, but a lot of the insects that are more accustomed to feeding on them are able to bypass that. Um, it can have some implications for management, but again, um, there are several options that are available, which we'll touch on later. So in reality, a lot of the times what you're gonna see is that the insect isn't gonna be isolated onto tissues where it's really easy to see just that pest. Um, oftentimes what you may see is a complex of various pests. 
Um, so in the case of the image on the left here, you can see there's quite a few scales on the foliage. You can see the adelgid adults inside their white woolly masses. You can even see some immatures kind of at the lower end of that um, twig on the left there. And then if you look at the right, there's likely some spider mites feeding on that tissue as well, but you've got a lot of superficial debris and it can get kind of tricky to tell exactly where one pest ends and the next one begins. Um, but generally speaking, if you're seeing those white woolly masses, that's a good indication that the pest was present. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the pest is actively present because those white masses can persist on the foliage for some time after the pest is gone. So you do have to look a little closer to be able to determine if there are any individuals that are still viable. Um, and that may entail looking for some of these immature specimens that begin settling. So they tend to want to feed at the base of the needles. So any of those new shoots that these crawlers are trying to migrate to, they're going to try to find the base of a needle, settle there, and then again, that's where they're going to stay for the remainder of their life. So with that, we'll touch on to feeding and damage. And as I mentioned, these are piercing sucking pests. So they have this long coil tube like mouth part that they actually insert into the plant tissue and probe around to find the cells they want to feed in. In the case of hemlock woolly adelgid, they like to feed in xylem ray parenchyma cells, which is functionally used for nutrient storage, nutrient transport, um, and kind of a catch all for, for these plant tissues. And you can see that if you look at these scanning electron images on the left here, it's actually several different layers of long tube like mouth part that kind of come together. So it's several different components that are each used, uh, whether that be for sensing chemicals, sensing you know physical touches of where it's probing inside the plant tissue to get to that particular cell. And the image on the right here, it's a little tricky to see. It's, it's kind of complicated, but there's a really thin line there that you can see from a cell dissection where we can see the style actually penetrating that R and that R cell is one of these parenchyma cells. So that's what they're ultimately trying to get to. Um, it's a very nutrient rich food source, um, which is also a problem for the tree because feeding in their nutrient storage area is obviously going to deplete their resources quite quickly. Um, but it's also going to be a very reliable food source for the pest. Now, once a tree has actually been infested, obviously it's removing nutrients from it directly, but the feeding itself also elicits quite a few responses by the host. So infestations on a hemlock are going to affect both the water and carbon, carbon cycling potentials. So the tree uses significantly less water and also is essentially not as productive. So it's not able to assimilate as much carbon as it would otherwise. So it's using less water, storing less carbon. Um, so it's kind of sending it into a stress spiral, more or less, where it's losing resources and under a condition where it's not able to be vigorous and healthy. And the plant also has other responses um, that are kind of interesting to consider as well. It's thought that they have a hypersensitive response so that wherever these little coiled mouth parts are actually probing into plant tissues, it seems like there's a buildup of hydrogen peroxide, which can be difficult for the tree to deal with. Um, and additionally, so we've talked about how this pest is a little more naturalized to say the west coast of the United States, but isn't to the east coast. The species of hemlocks on the east coast are more acclimated to dealing with defoliating insects. So the defensive chemical profiles that you see in the eastern hemlock species tends to be more active against those defoliators as opposed to piercing sucking insects. Uh, and the defensive profiles that would be useful against, say, an adelgid are what helps to make those species on the west coast or in the native range um, a lot more tolerant. Because you can actually see quite large populations on trees in the native range as well as on the west coast that have you know, a lot of adelgid activity but don't have the same kind of decline spiral that we see with the, the hemlocks that are on the east coast. Um, but again, part of that is just due to uh, the long-term evolutionary associations between which pests are feeding on them and how the trees have had to adapt in their environments. So with the insect causing that kind of damage, what kind of symptoms might you see? Uh, so in terms of plant injury, you're going to see dulling, kind of grayish colored foliage. Um, and again, with this insect feeding at the base of the, the actual needle there, it's going to kind of kill it slowly, at which point it's eventually going to defoliate and fall away. Uh, and over time, as they do this to a lot of the shoots, you start to see twig dieback, um, bud death, and ultimately reduced growth because all those growing tips are going to continue to decline and die back. So growth is going to have to occur um, more toward the interior, which is going to be more of a challenge. So you start to see symptoms at the very edges at first, and then it's ultimately going to work its way kind of throughout the entire canopy. And if you're in a setting where you've got stands of trees or kind of a larger area, what you tend to see is decline of the larger branches from the bottom up. Um, and ultimately, it's just kind of a decline spiral. So symptoms might start slow and they might start to ramp up over time, 
Um, a healthy tree may be able to persist as long as say 10 years. If a tree is a little more susceptible, maybe already dealing with stressors, or maybe you have a particularly bad infestation, uh, you may see mortality within about four years. But ultimately, if you've got a healthy infestation across hemlock trees, you can expect that the tree may not make it past about that four to 10 year window. Uh, so it is important to manage it or ultimately the tree can't usually overcome it on its own. Um, it's actually kind of interesting, though, if you actually start to look at how these uh, insects damage the tree over time within that four to 10 year period, and it kind of goes through stages. Um, so stage one would be your initial infestation. So say you have a tree, there's no hemlock woolly adelgids present, um, they become present, and then through those rapid reproductive potentials are able to build up populations very quickly, and you start to see really significant decline, kind of a shock factor. So you've got these huge populations all of a sudden causing stress to the tree, uh, the tree's responses to those stressors are to you know, further go into decline. So these accumulations of different problems uh, build up to start to have that really serious uh, decline and dieback that you would see throughout the canopy, throughout different trees. And because of that, those hosts become more or less a poor quality. So those hosts are no longer you know, vigorous, producing all the nutrients reliably and readily. So the pest populations start to decline because they're feeding on a host that isn't as, as attractive to them. Um, there's not as much new growth available. So ultimately, the population starts to crash just a bit, um, which you would think would be a good thing, maybe give the tree a chance to recover. However, because of that recovery period in stage two, as it does start to push out any kind of new growth, you tend to see rapid reinfestation um, and those problems just kind of returning and occurring all over again. So these cycles kind of occur over time, and ultimately the pressure gets to a point that mortality is generally going to be what happens because the tree is no longer able to sustain itself. So I mentioned that you might also see a variety of other pests. I think it's worth mentioning these as well, because if these pests are present, they may predispose uh, the tree to an attack by hemlock woolly adelgid because it's already stressed, or the actual infestation of adelgids may lead to these other infestations because the tree is again more susceptible. Um, so there's a variety of different armored scale pests that you can see in the top right there. Um, here in the Bartlett land, we get a lot of samples from kind of across the U.S. and we tend to see elongate hemlock scale with hemlock woolly adelgid more often than the others. But we have gotten samples before where we might see, you know, all of these different scales and adelgids present on the same tree. And you could imagine that that tree is under significantly more stress than the others um, within other infestations possibly. There are also a couple species of mites. There are some spider mites, a couple different species that you may encounter that'll cause speckling damage. Um, this is going to reduce photosynthesis, but isn't necessarily a tree killing or, or you know, significant problem, but could accumulate and, and be one of those contributing factors. Uh, and you also have rust mites, kind of like the spider mites, might cause stress, but aren't necessarily going to kill the tree. Um, and then a variety of fungal cankers, which generally tend to be secondary on stressed hosts. Um, but you could imagine a scenario where you have a complex of different pests here that are going to be difficult to overcome and are contributing to that downward spiral that's just going to keep happening. So when it comes to ecological impacts, you know, what, what does it mean when these insects are present and causing this kind of decline? If it's, say, just a single, you know, landscape tree, maybe that's not too bad, um, but you may also have huge stands of forests. Um, and because hemlocks are long-lived and shade-tolerant, they are capable of growing on their own. So you could have a single species stand that's getting more sun exposure. However, you may have a dense overstory with hemlocks below it because they are shade tolerant. So it can have interesting dynamics on which tree species that you have in a given landscape or a given forest. Um, but hemlocks serve a really useful role in that they're a little adaptable to a variety of different circumstances. Um, one of the other things that's a real problem on the East Coast is that they're often found along slopes and near waterways, which the hemlocks are providing some amount of erosion control on edges, um, but also water shading. And that's one of those things that maybe isn't intuitive, but if you think about this uh, tree as something that's shading the water, that's keeping temperatures more moderate and stable. And once the hemlocks are gone, if there's not a species that provides shade to the water and as temperatures increase, you're going to have influences and impacts on the insect populations, for instance, that live in the water. And if the insects aren't going to do as well, they're not going to serve as a food source for things like fish and birds. So even though, you know, the loss of hemlock itself may be a problem, it's also going to potentially have rippling out effects that will contribute to other problems throughout the ecosystem. And then just as a tree itself, hemlock is providing food, winter shelter, microclimate conditions for a variety of different wildlife and plant communities. Again, with it being so well established in many forests and kind of serving this uh, more robust role, it can be a real problem if those, those particular trees are no longer available. So next we'll touch on to management. 
Um, and we'll start with management with biological control. There's been a significant amount of effort that's went into trying to determine which biocontrol species may be effective to release at large scales. Um, there are two non-native Japanese predators that kind of come to the top. Uh, Sesagesimus suge is readily available and is bivoltine. And when I say readily available, what that means is that say you're you know, in charge of managing a forest or you're just a homeowner, you could order these insects online for release. They've been pretty well vetted um, and released at pretty large scales at this point. And it's difficult to determine exactly how well they establish or exactly how effective they are. Um, a lot of these biocontrol projects can be really difficult to get concrete data. Um, but this pest is feeding on it in the native range. And the bivoltine means that it has a mimic of basically both generations. So this thing is going to attack um, both the cystins and the progredians generations um, continuously throughout the year, which is unique compared to several of the other biocontrol agents that are available. So I believe that you can also order the Laracobia species there. However, it's not as readily available as the one before. Um, it might be more of a challenge, whether that be from production or just who has access to actually order it. Um, the consequence though with the Laracobius is that they are in sync with that overwintering generation. So in those uh, summer times, uh, early spring times, you're not really gonna see this insect being active. It's gonna be kind of its developmental period in between. Um, whereas again, with the species above, you're gonna see multiple generations that pair a lot better with the actual Hemlocholia delgid generations. So it might be a case where you would use both of these species um, or maybe just the uh, S. suge species, kind of depending on your needs in your particular situation. But these are the only two non-native Japanese predators that are used uh, at larger scales. There are a couple U.S. predators also in that Laracobius genus. Um, and interestingly, we see that there are some that we can gather from the Pacific Northwest, and there are some that we've collected from the Eastern uh, U.S. Both of these are in that same kind of grouping of only being active against that overwintering generation which can be a problem because you're, you're gonna maybe crash the population, but it's likely gonna be able to rebound. So they're, they're kind of a supplemental type uh, release. Uh, what we've seen though, is that the Laracobia species on the East Coast tend not to be as effective. Um, they've been here for a long period in the absence of Hemlock woolly adelgid. So they've developed a taste for pine bark adelgids. So while they will still feed on a variety of adelgids, their host seeking behaviors aren't necessarily going to lead them to locate hemlock woolly adelgids when other adelgids may be present nearby. Um, so it might not hurt to have it in the landscape, but it's also not going to be as effective as some of these others, which are a little more specific to their hosts. Um, one of the other species that's become uh, more important in recent history are the Leucopus silverflies. And they're interesting um, because we do see these on both the east and west coasts as well. Um, but we see very specific genetic differences um, within species populations. So even though we have the same species on the east and west coast, um, they have definitely acclimated to the adelgids that are available. So the flies that are on the west coast do have a preference for hemlock woolly adelgid, but the same fly species on the east coast does have a preference for pine bark adelgids. So it might be a case that even though we have a particular species in the range that's going to be more susceptible to hemlock woolly adelgid, it may be that we would need to bring in flies from the other coast to kind of help supplement, again, that control. Uh, and these are active during the summer generations. So these could be something you could release in combination with the Laracobius beetles that are only active in the winter and get kind of a more complete biocontrol program that integrates you know, both generations of the pest. Um, but again, there's these distinct populations that although they're the same species would need to be a consideration for you know, host seeking behavior and how effective they're going to be. When it comes to biocontrol, the reality is there's a lot of challenges and considerations that you really have to take into account. It's one thing to release these on a large scale in a forest, but if you wanted to say control a few trees and you know in your landscape, it may not be as effective there. Kind of varies and depends. Um, one of the biggest things that comes up if you start looking into this particular uh, scenario of these different biocontrol agents is that we've got a lot of different genera and a variety of different species, and there is some potential for hybridization, which may make the individuals better suited for control, or it can also make them uh, less suited for control. So we don't exactly know how this may shake out, and, you know, and uh, a lot of work goes into making sure that these agents are safe to release into the environment. However, how they may interact over time can be a difficult thing to measure um, on top of whether or not they're actually establishing and providing control. Uh, and as we've mentioned here, the phenological match about timing of when these predators are going to be present versus when the actual susceptible life stage 
whether that be an egg, an immature, or an adult of the hemlock woolly adelgid, how exactly they line up is going to determine how effective your controls are and whether or not you may need multiple species or repeated introductions of the same species to really see success. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, establishment under various conditions, depending on what the low temperatures might be, you know, annually in a given release area could have a big difference as to whether these things are going to persist over time or whether they can even survive over the winter at all. Um, and then if we're introducing these, are they providing competition for other natural enemies that are present in our landscape natively uh, that could be a problem and maybe make other pests a more significant, significant concern? Or might these beetles then just start directly feeding on other insects that, you know, for better or worse, uh, are also going to be a prey source? So depending on how specific each individual predator is, kind of determines how reliable they can be used or how uh, available they may be for even landowners to access them. So that's biocontrol. Um, we also have quite a few chemical control options available as well. Um, when it comes to chemical control, some of the most widely used products are things like imidacloprid and dinotefuron, um, but there are also uh, horticultural oils that can be applied at different times in the year that may help with smaller infestations. Um, the benefit of the two chemicals above are that they're both systemic. Um, however, their active timing and things like that are gonna be a little different. So with imidacloprid, you do get long-term control. So even as imidacloprid breaks down, the metabolites are also active against adelgids. So you get this really extended control period of maybe upwards of five to seven years from a single application. Um, so you'll get the knockdown over time. It's maybe not quite as quick as you may want. So timing of when the initial application has to go out would be important here, but you do get this extended control period, um, which can be very helpful if you're trying to protect, you know, say a lot of trees um, and you may not have the actual manpower to knock out a whole bunch of applications. Um, whereas something like Dinotefuron provides a much more rapid control, usually within about a month, but it's not going to persist past maybe a year or so. So you're not going to see that same long-term extended control, but you can get rapid control with, say, a really heavy infestation. Um, it's actually not uncommon in some areas for both products to be used. You might use the Dinotefuron to get that rapid control of a really you know, declining, stressed-out tree, and then you might use imidacloprid to provide that long-term control so that the infestations don't return. Um, as with anything, you do have to consider, you know, management decisions also require kind of a deeper evaluation of other factors that might be present. Um, so aside from just your time frame of control, you know, your tree's location, whether it's, you know, proximity to sensitive areas might determine whether or not you could do certain types of applications, whether it needs to be, you know, trunk spray and ejection, things of that nature. Um, but also tree health and symptom appearance. So if you know, you've got a really small infestation, it may not warrant an expensive treatment um, unless you're trying to do it preventatively. So there's a lot of different factors that are going to kind of go into whether or not a particular product is going to be better than another. Um, and you also may want to take into account whether beneficials are being released in the area. Because if you're releasing beneficial insects, then all of your practices should line up with that in such a way that you're not going to endanger them and also reduce their populations over time. Um, just kind of anecdotally, the interesting thing with Dinotefuron is you may also get control with armored scales. So if you've got a case of a hemlock tree that has a multiple pest infestation, you may be able to manage multiple things with a single application. Uh, so cultural controls, some things to consider. Um, hemlock is a shallow rooted species. So you really um, want to try to make sure it's getting water during dry periods, because this is gonna kind of help reduce stress of the tree, hopefully make it a little less susceptible to attack, um, or at least predispose it a little less so. Um, similarly, you can prune, uh, prune or reduce crowding to improve sunlight penetration. Um, we have some slides at the end that I think are, are really interesting to kind of touch on this about how much sunlight hemlocks may want, what that sunlight might mean to the hemlock willy adelgid itself. Um, and the other important thing to keep in mind with adelgid infestations is avoiding excess nitrogen fertilization. Um, generally, when you fertilize trees with a lot of nitrogen, they're going to grow really well, push out a lot of new growth. Uh, but again, that tender succulent growth is also the same tissue that these adelgids want to feed on. So you're creating a perfect food source that then they're going to be highly attracted to. So generally speaking, you would want to avoid those excess fertilizations until you've got the pest under control, or you may make the problem worse. Um, and in some cases, it's possible that mechanical control or just removing the tree may be the most appropriate thing. Um, it really just kind of depends on the individual circumstance and what the actual end goal is. Um, but there are cases where that may be the most appropriate thing. Now, if you're looking at kind of an IPM approach here, what are the best management practices that you might be able to do? Uh, the US Forest Service actually has a really great uh, guide resource manual uh, that kind of talks about the integration of chemical and biological control. Uh, this is mostly geared towards, you know, larger plantings, forested areas, um, parks, things of that nature. Uh, but the approach can kind of be the same depending on if, 
the area that you're trying to treat or manage is similar in terms of stand density or which species are present. The idea behind this approach, though, is that you're utilizing multiple levels of chemical protection in addition to leaving some trees untreated so that they can be kind of a reservoir for biocontrol establishment. So again, you're going to be releasing some insects, also doing treatments, but doing it in such a way that you've got a mosaic so that you can preserve some of these beneficial insects while still getting control on the trees that are important. And I pulled these two images from that guide and I think they're worth talking about. Um, the image that you can see on the left has that green recreation area with maybe some benches, park areas, things of that nature. All of the trees directly surrounding it are obviously going to be ones that would be at greatest risk of possibly causing damage if they fail. So all of those trees are perpetually full protected. So that's likely going to be a combination of imidacloprid and dinotefuron. Um, but again, these trees are going to be heavily protected so that there's not going to be as much damage there. And then as you shift out a little deeper into the stand, you've got temporary full protection where maybe they get one treatment of a you know, long-term control. Uh, maybe they just get one short-term control, kind of depending on how bad the infestation may be or how many trees you have. Again, there's a lot of factors that are going to go into this, but you're not going to be consistently making applications to these because the hope is that eventually you'll kind of establish these beneficial insect populations. Because as you get deeper into that stand, you'll see that there's no protection on some of those interior trees. And as you release those predators, they establish their first and will work their way around um, anywhere the infestations are present. Now, that's if you have kind of a, a sight line area that you want to target moving into a forest. Say you have really high value trees that maybe are scattered around in a, in a mixed stand area, it may be a case where you provide full protection to the highest value trees. So you would identify which ones, you know, are oldest or maybe the most uh, aesthetically pleasing, whatever the case may be. And those would be the ones that receive those heavier treatments. And then again, kind of having a mosaic effect where you have some trees that you maybe that have heavy infestations that get a rapid control product, but isn't going to be persistent in that foliage for a long time. Um, but then leaving some trees with no protection at all so that as you introduce these beneficial insects, they have somewhere to go that's going to have both prey items and possibly be less um, off target effects, depending on what's being applied. And then some interactions to talk about. So um, hemlock woolly adelgid uh, infestation reduces tree defenses and permits increased fulivore performance. Uh, so what this is saying is that ultimately, if you're getting an infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid, it causes a systemic change in tree defenses. So it's not able to mount an effective defense. And even if it were able to, it's just not able to do it as directly targeted against those piercing sucking insects. So consequently, when the tree is infested, it's stressed, not able to mount the defense, you then are more susceptible to any foliage feeding insects. So something like a spongy moth uh, outbreak, for instance, could be really devastating in the Northeast. Um, so one of these other articles also saw that spongy moths gained more weight when they were feeding on infested uh, hemlock foliage. So again, the trees aren't able to mount as effective of a defense. So the caterpillars are able to feed on more of the tissue and then consequently grow bigger and larger. Um, which can really be a problem in outbreak years, maybe wouldn't be as bad on a year where the moth populations were low, um, but the potential here to have these complex pest problems that are going to spiral out of control is significantly increased. Um, so some of the other interactions that I think are really interesting uh, has to do with sunlight exposure, because again, with hemlocks being a shade tolerant species, you may see them in you know, an understory with a pretty dense canopy above them. So crawlers of the hemlock woolly adelgid prefer to settle in shaded areas. So for some reason, they appear to be sensitive to heat and solar exposure, and it's more of a visual light as opposed to a UV light from what the study determined. But long story short, anywhere where sun is you know, heavily uh, occurring on a branch, for instance, you tend to see less of the hemlock uh, woolly adelgid infestation in those areas. Uh, so any of the shaded parts of the plant are likely going to have a heavier pest pressure. Um, which may have implications for management. It may be that if you wanted to prune the canopy in such a way to increase sun exposure, you may be able to reduce pest pressure on a given tree. Um, however, it's a little more complicated than that as you start to dig into it. So while more sunlight may reduce hemlock woolly adelgid infestation, um, the actual infestation itself on the tree and some of your treatments, so something like imidacloprid itself, also can contribute to solar stress susceptibility. So if you've got an infestation and you're treating, the tree may be more susceptible to solar stress. So if you're providing more sun to control it, the pest and all these different things are happening at the same time, you may actually make your tree weaker. 
Uh, so it's kind of interesting and it's a bit of a balancing act um, and they haven't quite worked out exactly, you know, what recommendations are going to be ideal or perfect for every scenario. And again, there's going to be a lot of different factors that are going into whether one thing works compared to another. Um, but while more sun may help lower pest pressure, pest pressure and treatments are also going to make the tree potentially um, more susceptible to sun damage. So maybe preserving dense canopies will help protect infested hemlocks from early mortality but maybe on larger trees, uh, greater sun exposure may permit some amount of recovery from infestation stress. Um, and then in combination with treatments, you may be able to help those plants recover a little better. So the next slide up here uh, to kind of bring all this together here with the sunlight exposure, um, this paper from 2020 also showed that regardless of whether hemlock woolly adelgid is infesting a given hemlock tree, extra sun exposure did contribute to greater growth. Um, so what this means is that maybe in a forested setting, doing some stand thinning to get increased sun exposure onto hemlocks may make them a little more resilient. So even though, you know, treatments or infestations may make them more susceptible to sun damage, they do still tend to come out on top. So that extra sun can definitely help with their resiliency and hopefully be able to help you over time. Um, and then, so kind of just to pull that all in summary here. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is a significant pest on the east coast. We don't really see the same problems on the west coast um, or in the native range. Uh, we do have two generations annually. They're parthenogenic, so that means that they're all being produced from unfertilized eggs. Uh, if you're looking to find out whether you have this pest in your landscape, you're monitoring for those woolly masses. You can kind of gauge the infestation from their presence, but also the presence of the immatures at the needle bases. Um, and then also there are multiple management options that are available depending on the circumstances and the needs, um, whether that be chemical, biological, mechanical, or cultural. Um, but as always, you know, keeping trees healthy is the best way to make sure that they're going to be less predisposed um, to the pest itself and also a little more resilient over time. Um, but with that, that's all I have for you. So I'd like to thank you. And then I think we have some time for questions and discussion. Let me see. All righty, thanks so much, Jeremy. That was a great presentation. Um, so here is my thingy. It is frozen, of course. Stand by, okay. So now we have some time for Q and A's. We do have a couple uh, already in the chat. We had a couple pop up that I think you um, you addressed sufficiently in your presentation, but um, the first one being, have plant growth regulators been proven effective? Yeah, so I actually haven't seen much data on that in particular. Um, I would imagine that even if you're doing growth regulators, any amount of new tissue growth is still going to be targeted by the immatures. Um, so I would imagine that even if you are doing some approach of trying to keep the plant small, you're still going to see infestations and those smaller plants may be more susceptible to the damage actually. Um, but because you have those several stages of infestation where the population kind of explodes, contracts, and explodes again, um, I don't think you're going to get long-term control by trying to manage plant size. Okay, fantastic. Um, our next question is, uh, how does strategy change overall in your water if you have a delgid and elongate hemlock scale? Yeah, and, and again, that's going to be kind of tricky. So if you're near water, you obviously aren't going to want to do you know, foliar sprays, things of that nature. Um, and even a bark spray may be challenging depending on, you know, how close you are to water. Um, you do have the option of being able to do injections, um, which I think could provide control for both adelgids and scales at the same time. Uh, you would just want to pick which products are going to be most effective and are going to leach out of the plant um, to the least amount. And obviously you'd want to check on your labels to make sure that everything's appropriate to use in those given areas. Um, but, you know, depending on which product you wanted to use, being able to do bark drenches, being able to do injections or soil drenches, uh, you have a variety of different application methods that may be viable um, under different circumstances. And if you just happen to be in an area where, you know, applications may not be viable, that could be a case where these biocontrols and trying to preserve plant health through cultural care may be the most effective solution. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions, but I'll just do a final call for questions if, if anybody wants to pop any into the Q&A. Um, if not, okay, no more shut up. Okay, well, thank you all very much for joining today. I did put Jeremy Sloan's email at the bottom if you would like to record that and just uh, reach out if you have any further questions. Um, other than that, thanks again for attending this webinar.
please check out our webinar series. Um, we have tons of free webinars. There's another one coming up on tree injections. Um, and you can access that through this QR code here in the top right.